from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Dimination. I'm Chief of the Rare Book and Special Collections Division here at the Library of Congress. Many familiar faces. I'm just going to give you a welcome and hand this over to Casey. But I do want to do a pitch for the division. Uh, we are the home of letterpress printing here at the Library of Congress, and we have a lot of it. Not only the antiquarian story, which is now um, in a collection that's approaching a million volumes, but we're also very avid collectors of modern day fine press printing and letterpress printing. So I encourage everybody to get a reader's card and come and use this material. I can justify building the collection when people come to see it. So I'm practicing the principle of, if I build it, you will come. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to hand this over to Casey. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks, Mark. Thanks so much. And thank all of you for coming. We're really thrilled about the program uh, this afternoon. So I'm only going to speak for just a couple minutes about what the program is, who it honors, and what AFA is, the American Printing History Association. Um, so the program is named the Denker Fellows. Um, and some of you have probably read, George is going to pass out information about the Denker Fellowship. It's um, for all students are eligible at the collegiate or post, you know, post-grad level. Um, this year we had six wonderful fellows. Uh, they get their membership paid by AFA, their chapter paid. But more importantly, they get to meet the printers and the collectors and the scholars and the writers that make up AFA. And so of the six, we have five of them here today. The sixth moved to Reno, Nevada, and she didn't quite want to come in for a 10-minute presentation. Uh, Jamie Schaefer, who's really wonderful. Uh, this, what uh, George is holding up, this is a screen print uh, done at Dennis O'Neill's Hand Print Work Workshop International in Alexandria. Um, it's taken from an image that Stuart Bradley, one of our members, photographed. It was later made into a woodcut, Chris. Is this right? It's originally the woodcut. It's originally the woodcut. And so Stuart reproduced that. Oh, but, but well, in any case, it, it's seen different um, iterations. And so that's Mike. Mike would really love this program. He loves students. And he was the one at AFA who really got behind the 2010 conference at the Corcoran and really wanted to make it about education. And so I know that he'd be happy with uh, five, our five speakers here today. Um, AFA is a wonderful organization. I have information about it. I'm not going to sell it too hard here. Um, I have some examples of the keepsakes from our Waze Goose. The Waze Goose is a party for printers. Uh, it was wonderful. It was just last Saturday at the home of Chris and Pat Manson. Um, so if you have any questions about AFA, I'm going to turn it over to George briefly to announce the Denker Fellowship um, process for next year. Thanks, Casey. We're so glad that you all could be here today. It's, um, it's a great thrill when a bunch of people turn up when you announce something. So uh, <laughs> we really appreciate your being here. And we really thank Mark and the Rare Books and Special Collections Division because this is a special place for us to have this. Um, we're starting to roll into recruiting our next year's uh, fellows. Um, this is eligible to students anywhere in the region. Uh, we're reaching out to everybody we can possibly think of uh, to, to recruit. Um, we haven't set the, the number this year. Um, I'm assuming it'll be at least six and maybe eight. Um, the little flyer that I did just sort of on spec today says eight. Um, and. Uh, Anybody who is uh, a student of book arts, printing, design is eligible. All we need is a brief statement of who you are and what you're interested in uh, sent to Casey and uh, with a contact at the institution and we can, uh, we can go from there. We'll be selecting them uh, before, I would say before the, the year is very old, the year 2015 is very old and giving them the year's membership in the in National AFA and the chapter, and inviting them to join in uh, with all of our activities for the coming year. So if you know someone uh, who is a good candidate, encourage them to get in touch. And welcome. OK. And lastly, before we start, I'd like to introduce George Barnum. Uh, he's, been, <laughs> <laughs> he's, 
agency historian at the Government Printing Office and the incoming president of AFA Chesapeake. And I'm Casey Smith. I teach at um, George Washington University, Corcoran School of the Arts. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started. The presentations are going to be about 10, 15 minutes. We hope to have time for questions uh, when we finish. I'll ask everybody to speak into the mic because it's being recorded and you need to speak into the mic, okay? So um, let's start, and I'm not going to give ind individual introductions. They're just going to kind of come on up. So Jihei, you want to start? Thank you. I'm grateful to be here today. I'm grateful to be a Tanker Fellow. Um, I know this is an American Printing History Association, but I thought I would take a different approach and talk about a little bit about Korean printing history and talk about four, uh, four uh, print works that are very important in printing history. Um, okay. The first one is called Mugu Jeonggwang De Dharani Gyeong. In English, the Pure Light Dharani Sutra. It is the oldest extant woodblock print book in the world. It was discovered during restoration of a stone pagoda called Sakata, which was completed around 751 AD during Goryeo Dynasty. Dharani Sutra was a type of ritual speech similar to a mantra. One of the proofs that it was from the uh, 7th century was that it contained four of the 18 Muju Jeja. Uh, Muju Jeja were new, new characters created and put into use during the reign of Empress Wu in China. Um, those characters were discontinued using after the death of Empress Wu in 704 AD. Um, just for the background, um, before 1446, uh, Korean, we didn't have the writing system. So we used Chinese characters. That's why you will see all those Chinese characters in Korean, Korea printing. The second one is called Heinsa Dejangyeongpan or Palman Dejangyeongpan. It is the world's oldest and the most comprehensive and accurate version of the Tripitaka. I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> Tripitaka is a Sanskrit word and it is the traditional term used by Buddhists to describe their various canons of scriptures. Dejangyeongpan is stored inside the four wooden buildings like And I read that it's because of the natural airflow, it is preserved for hundreds of years. Um, it's, they are still printable. Um, it includes Buddhist scriptures about 84,000 afflictions. They are engraved on over 87,000 wood, wooden printing blocks. The complete collection was made over the period of 12 years between 1236 and 1248 to appeal for spiritual help in overcoming the national crisis of the, of the Mongolian invasions. Changgyeong Panjan was inscribed that the place that they hold the wooden blocks are inscri uh, was inscribed as UNESCO World Her Cultural Heritage in 1995, and the wooden blocks, wooden printing blocks was included in the UNESCO Memory of the World Program in 2007. <coughs> When Johannes um, Gutenberg was printing the Gutenberg Bible in 1455, Koreans were not just making kimchi in their backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Seven years before the Gutenberg Bible, in 1377, Jikji Shimgyeong, or in short, Jikji, was printed during Goryeo Dynasty. It is the world's oldest extant book printed with movable metal type. UNESCO confirmed Jigji as the world's oldest metalloid type in September 2001 and includes it in the Memory of the World program. Jigji consists of first and second volumes, but the location of the first volume is unknown. However, in 2011, a group of scholars announced the discovery of the movable metal type that were used to print Jungdoga in 1239 about 150 years earlier than Jigji. They uncovered bronze artifacts from Goryeo Dynasty. Inside a teapot and wash basin, they found several uh, metal types. The types were taken to a couple of research labs. They tested the age of the dried up ink gathered from the types and the location of the metal used to mark the types. So the data showed that they were from 
Uh, they were made between 850 and 1280 AD in the West and Central Korea. As of 2013, about 112 types were, have been discovered from the same site. Using those types and the same casting techniques from Goryeo Dynasty, they were, they were able to um, restore the type system and print it Jungdoga again. So that uh, during Goryeo Dynasty, this is how they created the movable metal types. First, they wrote Chinese characters on a piece of paper. Uh, and on the hard wax, just like the one that you see, um, they will put the piece of paper and carved out the characters. And they will put wax sticks to those carved out characters and make it into a cast. And they wrapped it with ochre paste. The guy above there is making the paste. Uh, ochre soil paste. And wrap it around those, uh, these uh, wax casts. And it was put in the crucible. The wax will melt and the soil paste will harden. So then now you have the mold. And they will pour the melted iron and harden it. And they will just um, break, uh, break the uh, mold and take the type out uh, and polish it. This is another um, mold. And these are the ones they found that's supposed to print it Jikji, the, and these are the, chung, the ones that are older than Jikji, 150 years. And he is an expert, and he's saying types with the restored types. And these little um, wax figures are reenacting, proofing, printing, and the bottom one is binding. Um, I didn't know too much about printing history uh, till I started the Korkan, and that got me really uh, more interested in learning about the printing history and printmaking. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to study and learn more. I'm looking forward to learn more. Thank you. Oh, I just graduated from the Korkan College of Art and Design from the Art and the Book Program. I'm originally from Korea. And I moved here from Utah. That's not where I'm from. I spent a lot of time there, but I moved here to study at the Korkan. Oh, I'm Jihei. Jihei Kwan. Jihei Kwan. I think question? We'll, we'll yes. take questions maybe oh. at, the, at the very end. Oh, OK, okay. sorry. Thank you. Hi, I'm Travis Boatwright. Um, I graduated from George Mason University in May. so. Um, really young and a baby when it comes to the type and printing and design and everything, but I've just learned a lot of the past couple years. Um, so I'm going to sort of take you down a weird timeline that's sort of modern day um, and sort of present to you. I was going to show a video clip, but decided not to for certain reasons. But um, has anybody seen the movie Helvetica by chance? Of course. Um, so when I was in 10th grade, when I was 14, at Deep Run High School in Richmond, Virginia, I saw that movie. And it just, it, I think, changed my life in a way. Not because Helvetica is the greatest font in the world or anything, but <laughs> the, the idea of Helvetica and what, uh, cap, what was captured in that moment was the beginning, the intro, when you see him uh, laying out Helvetica in the metal type and seeing him ink it up and then see him drop this piece of paper that goes on crooked and then pull it off and this see a printed Helvetica. Um, and from that moment, I was like, I want to do that. Like, don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Um, so this is sort of like the story of me getting to do that, which took a long time. So I was 14 when that happened, which was, I'm 22 now. Uh, so almost a decade ago, which is weird to think about. Um, so going in, to high school, we had design classes, which was, I was fortunate to be introduced to design at a young age. Um, so I got to explore type um, a lot. And then this idea of Helvetica is what I called it. This, that type was all around us. Everything had type, design was all around us. Um, so that was something that was sparked early. Um, so sort of my early explorations with type and some projects, we were just using, creating abstract things with uppercase at the top, symbols in the middle, and lowercase in the middle, I mean at the bottom. Um, and so I was really interested in creating like type as image. 
um, because I didn't really have an art background at all. So I didn't really, I was like, oh, I can do this stuff on the computer because I grew up with computers. I don't have to use a pencil because I don't like pencils. Uh, so continuing on, all these are made with just type. Um, so this really using this letters to show direction, the point people using like their eye just to move them around and stuff like that. I have no idea what this means or what I was trying to do, honestly. But it's something interesting and something I was doing at a younger age than what I've learned than most people were doing. Um, so when I graduated high school, I was like, I'm going to do design. I want to learn about type. I want to explore this. Um, so I chose George Mason and got into their program as a BFA for graphic design. Um, and I knew I just wanted to learn as much as I could when I was there. Um, so in that, learned a lot of art history and a lot of modern art in the sort of like 50s and 60s was a lot of influence of my thinking and what I saw in design. Uh, and I also saw the movie Typeface that talked about the Hamilton wood, uh, wood type, which again was just like, I need to touch this stuff. When, how can I get my hands on it? And it was in the history of graphic design class with Don Starr, which I think some of you guys know. Uh, that he does a quick little letterpress workshop, brings in like a literally a handful of letters. We get to like print one word with a little hand press, and that was like all I've done. Um, so I got encouraged to sign up to be a Dinker Fellow uh, by Don, and knowing that they did a calendar every year was sort of my next baby step. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of my college work um, with studying types. So this going through and actually learning about individual letters and defining and actually being able to talk about type in a sophisticated way was really interesting to me. Um, everybody in my class was like, I just want to make cool stuff in Photoshop. I was like, but the apex, like, <laughs> come on. Um, and so just kept on exploring fun things using digital type, especially what you can do in understanding the limitations of metal type or no limitations of limitations of metal type, uh, which is soon I'll find out. Uh, and then even creating type with hair that I've done, um, which so just keep on expanding type and seeing what the potential is with type and how it literally is everywhere. Um, I got to meet Paula Cher, which she's a famous designer that it's a, very influential person when I was learning about design in high school um, and even signed it years in type and that's something that's just always been really important to me. Um, so eventually at George Mason under Helen Frederick I got to take some printmaking classes and learned a lot of digital printmaking classes uh, processes with like pronto plates and copper plates and transferring digital images to those. So just sort of exploring that type of stuff which I did a lot of photography in high school and early college, so I got to sort of relook at old photography and produce it in a different manner. Um, and even this, this creating stories of my life and figuring out what things meant and being able to put that on physical paper was a lot different process than graphic design. Um, and just learning the fine detailing of metal tools on copper plates was just something that was awesome to figure out. Um, I went to Australia and studied for six months in Canberra, and I found a print museum there, which was the most literally middle of nowhere, flat nothing print museum that has workable linotype machines. Um, so I got the, the man there, he literally opened up the whole machine and tried to show me every moving part in that thing and showed me every little stuff of how it worked, which was amazing, um, and even let me type out my name on it, which took like 15 minutes to find the lettering. Um, so again, this, this slow process of getting closer and closer to actually really using metal type. So up to this point, I've never really touched metal type, but I knew it was something I wanted to do. Um, so then finally using letterpress this summer, I worked on the calendar that they do. Um, and I got to work with Chris Manson at his studio, which is sort of a heaven on earth, sort of a studio, an amazing collection. And so not knowing how to I've used minimal type, I understand letting and spacing and everything you need to know, what I think I need to know um, that I want to do. So I got to use a very basic layout. It wasn't anything impressive, but I know it's like the first step of like sort of my future with metal type and using this group to sort of 
enhance that. So this is my first pro big project I've done. Um, it's nothing special at all, but I've been reading Moby Dick this year. Um, so I was just playing off that, call me January, with that. Um, so it was something clever. It was fun to get this in the nitty gritty and sort of learn the whole process of creating one full layout and then the whole printing process of doing a series of 125. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at now. I still have a lot to learn. I still don't really don't know anything. Um, but it's been a fun process and it's sort of crazy that I feel like I have a different perspective since I came from a digital era and now I'm sort of working to metal type and sort of figuring out how they have a relationship and how they work with each other and work against each other in a way. So, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if we brought any examples of the calendar. Maybe Ray has some, I'm not sure. They are available on the website. Travis was far too humble, it's beautiful print. Uh, Jihei has a book up over here also. We're gonna continue with Amy Nichols. Hello, I'm gonna try to talk really loud. Um, my name is Amy Nichols and I am in the uh, Art in the Book program at the Corcoran. I'm gonna talk to you today about cyanotype printing. Um, that's what I like to do. Um, I guess give you a little bit of background. I got my bachelor's degree in art history from Radford University and my last semester in school I decided to take a semester off and go to Sudan because that's just what people do, right? <laughs> so I was uh, lucky enough to be a photographer in Sudan so um, some of the um, photographs have inspired me to uh, move into cyanotype. This fine looking fella is uh, Sir John Herschel and he is the person who is credited with uh, inventing the cyanotype process. Um, he's an astronomer by trade and so most of his cyanotypes um, were used uh, in planning out uh, star patterns, uh, celestial uh, things. And he was next door neighbors with Anna Atkins. And in 1843, she uh, came from England and went on, um, she was trained as a botanist. So she actually used his cyanotype process and was one of the first uh, female photographers to use, the, um, she's using what is called photogram. So she doesn't actually have a camera. She's just laying the seaweed on top of the chemical coated paper and using UV light to um, expose her images. And she was able to create an entire book uh, on scientific illustration in 1843 that is uh, known around the world now. And I like cyanotype, um, I don't know, I feel kind of like an alchemist. So there are two uh, chemicals that you use and they normally come marked A and B. But, um, <laughs> but it's, it's um, ferric ammonium citrate and then ferric cyanocy cyan cyanide. And um, yeah, it is cyanide, so you need to be a little bit careful. Um, I, the first couple of uh, print runs that I did, I did in my bathroom and I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm doing this in my bathtub and my professor was like, you probably don't wanna do that. So, um, <laughs> I'm just really not good at uh, hide and seek anymore because I glow in the dark. But other than that, <laughs> I'm perfectly fine. Um, so, um, when you order the kits, they come with the uh, two chemicals already, uh, meet it out for you, but it's a one-to-one -one ratio and then you put, um, warm water to dissolve and then you can coat your paper um, and then you can also use fabric I don't have a lot of success with fabric I prefer watercolor paper reefs uh, paper and this semester I'm actually in a paper making class so I'm making my own handmade paper for my cyanotypes um, and then this is just kind of the uh, process and Cyanotype is a negative process, so areas that are light, that light does not hit, will remain white. Um, you can do it as a positive process if you go in Photoshop and reverse your image. So if you wanted to make it, it's technically a negative process, but you can make it a positive process as well. Um, and intensification. I'm doing a little bit of experiments with this. Um, some, some of the blues will come out like a medium blue, 
and if you want it to be the real deep cyan blue, then um, you can use, um, I use uh, hydrogen peroxide. I don't uh, mix it with water, I just use hydrogen peroxide and spray it and it comes out pretty well. I have some images here where I've done some uh, toning <clears throat> because not everybody wants to look at blue images all the time. <laughs> so uh, my first uh, image is not toned at all. Um, and then the second image is a tannic solution and you can get that from tea. Um, and then the third image is uh, Lipton. <laughs> and then the last <laughs> image <laughs> Because different teas will give you, I've actually tried a green tea and it did not give me a very good image at all, but Lipton tea works pretty well, so. Um, the, again, the alchemist in me mixing up random stuff in the kitchen. Let's see what this brand does. And then the last is with sodium uh, carbonate. So I can, get, um, I can get anything from a deep blue to a, to a decent purple. Um, I've seen people get greens. I'm not there yet, but I'm still trying. Um, and then this is um, different solutions where I've used the same uh, butterfly image. So, and what I am working toward is something like this. This actually came in a kit, um, so the image is not mine, but I, um, it's now on a scarf. So, but uh, what I'm uh, wanting to do for thesis as I move into that is I wanna do, um, something on constellations, um, because the stars are set. There's no uh, randomization about that. They are what they are. But uh, from different um, ethnic backgrounds, you get, because when I was in Sudan, I was looking up and my guide was like, I said, oh, look how nice Orion looks tonight. He said, what is Orion? I was like, it's that right there. And he said, oh, you're looking at Osiris. And I'm like, no, I'm looking at Orion. And so in different parts of the world, different patterns of stars are, you know, go with their culture. So that's what I want to do, look into cultural astronomy and why people choose to make the patterns that they do. So that's pretty much it for me. Good. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, today I'd like to talk about my, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Kevin Wisniewski. Um, I've met a few of you before and had a great time at the um, Baltimore, um, Museum of Industry. So we actually got to work with a um, linotype ourselves down there. So that was great. Um, today I'd like to actually talk about my part of my dissertation, which actually focuses on 18th century printing, printers, and uh, the relationships between them. Um, actually, I'm going to backtrack a little bit because the, the dissertation actually focuses on somebody who was not a printer. Um, so somebody, uh, um, I dare say, like myself, that finds himself amongst all of these printers working on collaborations uh, and the like. Um, this gentleman's name is Francis Hopkinson. He was born in Philadelphia. Um, I think his gravestone tells us a whole lot about him already, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, he was a federal judge. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a designer of the American flag. He was the first uh, Native American composer of songs, uh, and I could go on and on. Um, so there's many sides to, to Hopkinson. Um, but what interested me most is, here's a, where Hopkinson exists uh, in Trumbull's uh, signing of the Declaration. Uh, what excites me most about Hopkinson is how he collaborated with uh, printers during the 18th century and a variety of printers, both looking at uh, satire uh, and uh, various uh, war propaganda during the American Revolution, but more importantly, what, where he thought the direction of writing was going and where the future of writing was going uh, in America and, and in general. And he saw uh, essentially that printers held all the power. And this is very scary and dangerous for the, for the founders themselves. Uh, but he thought that the future of writing was printing. And I'll show you a couple of examples of what I mean. Uh, actually, still as a student in the College of Philadelphia, 1762, uh, he writes a very long poem called Science, looking at uh, how science and education and printing will actually lead the country to liberty, freedom, 
uh, and the like. Uh, the poem gets published by William Dunlap, uh, a Philadelphian and former partner of Benjamin Franklin, uh, and uh, is actually republished uh, by Andrew Stewart in Lancaster, PA. Stewart was previously ousted from Philadelphia, run out of business by Ben Franklin. So he was living in Lancaster at the time, uh, living off of reprinting uh, pamphlets. Uh, most historians argue that, uh, and this is actually where the story ends, most historians are actually arguing that uh, Stewart uh, reprinted this, and this was actually the first case of uh, piracy in uh, America, so pre-copyright laws, but the first pirated American work. Uh, Hopkinson uh, decides to retaliate by writing an advertisement in a variety of newspapers uh, in Philadelphia and New York uh, arguing that uh, he had, his work had been stolen and this printer's work was of a lesser quality. Um, it doesn't stop there, though, because Hopkinson ends up then, uh, uh, his advertisement gets picked up by other printers, including Hugh Gain and James Rivington, who decide to buy all the books from Philadelphia and resell them at their presses. Um, they simultaneously, as they reprint Hopkinson's advertisement, they reprint their own advertisements underneath, uh, actually apologizing for uh, printing an even cheaper version, but uh, enjoying the work so much that they couldn't resist to reprint it. Um, at this point, you'll notice in a variety of these newspapers in Philadelphia, in New York, in Boston, uh, all of these printers are now just riffing off of each other. They're now beginning to uh, misrepresent themselves by pretending to be other printers. And what's most interesting is that none of these printers actually reprinted the work. They were just distributing the same work uh, amongst each other. So what we have happening actually here, and finally Ben Franklin buys several copies and takes them to the printer of the king, William Strahan, uh, what we actually have happening here is something that most historians say shouldn't have happened. Right? We believe in this singular circuit. Uh, economic and political rivalries exist between printers at this time. But if uh, APA has not taught me anything else, it's that printers are a fun, funny, eclectic group of folks with a sense of humor, first off, uh, and real collaborations. And what we have happening here is despite what should exist as rivalries, what should exist as um, uh, political rivalries, economic rivalries, business rivalries, uh, turns out to be a big game and a big bunch of fun amongst friends and, and uh, fellow craftspersons. So this is where I, I transition into a later work by Hopkinson where he and uh, actually the son of uh, Dunlap, uh, John Dunlap, uh, work on uh, a series of articles that actually break, literally stretch and pull the idea of print from uh, its confines and constraints. To the left we have what looks like a normal periodical and to the right we have Hopkinson and Dunlap playing with print and actually torturing right, the linear form. This is eight, uh, 1786. Uh, and what we have happening here is on the literal level Hopkinson is uh, commenting about a newspaper rivalry between two folks in Philadelphia. But what he's actually saying is that print, uh, the printed word, is the future of literature. That we should use print, we should use typography to its extremes and to create new literature, to create new meaning of the world. Uh, this gets further extended with something that looks like concrete poetry or visual art, um, visual poetry. Uh, this is what's called the sample of good writing. And Hopkinson essentially says that the typography and the way it's laid out should display the meaning of the text. That we don't even need the words themselves as long as the layout and the form uh, is, is appropriately and effectively done. And so if you read just parts of the line on the left here, he says, um, frequently forming a serpentine line in which according to Hogarth, the beauty of all things consists. And again on the subsequent page, ever flowing like the waves of the seas and their periods closing in such musical cadence, et cetera, et cetera. So 
The next time we see something like this is actually in the early 20th century. Or oh, that's my argument. <laughs> this is actually one of several letters that Hopkinson designs to Jefferson, to Franklin, to several printers to say, this is what I'd like to do. And he actually works with printers, including Dunlap and later Thomas Dobson, who uh, prints the first uh, encyclopedia in America, uh, to actually create what he, what he wants it later. Uh, the first person he, interestingly enough, sends this to is Thomas Jefferson, <coughs> who's in Paris at this time. And Jefferson says, this is an absolutely horrible idea. This takes the power out of the, uh, out of the hand of the writer and places it into the hands of the printer. Do you really want to do this? And he cites, what if we remember Bell instead of Thomas Paine? So this is the big worry of, of Jefferson. So, and that's a large part of my, my, uh, my dissertation. I did want to make a, a, a brief look at Mary Catherine Goddard as well. Um, the, one of the printer, early printers of uh, the Declaration of Independence, and representing Baltimore here. So this will go, this will go very briefly, but uh, this is another thing I, I'm looking at. Uh, and specifically in the news most recently, if you followed uh, actually a New York Times article, I think that we ran in August, uh, there has been new controversy over the Declaration of Independence, specifically concerning whether or not this is a period or not, right? So what I'm actually arguing throughout my dissertation is not to look at the, the handwriting and the various editions of, of, um, of uh, Jefferson or Matlack's um, renditions, handwritten, but to also consider the various versions, various broad, uh, broad size of the Declaration of Independence and how the design, how the layout, how the typography also give alternative readings to colonial America. Just a couple of quick designs, little ornate symbols from Goddard's version. Uh, and then keeping in mind as well that she is a woman printer. And while there have been a couple of books uh, written generally, surveys about women printing in the 18th century, this is still something that needs to be explored further. And I note this especially with the uh, name her signatory. She's actually the first person to design the Declaration of Independence with the signatories. Her name at the very bottom outside the margins. So something to consider. <coughs> and finally, uh, just this past year, we had Mindy Bellhoff uh, from Intima Press up in Manhattan actually remake Goddard's version of the Declaration of Independence. And I think one of the conclusions that I'd like to make is that we all dip our toes in the waters and try printing uh, just to get that alternative reading, that alternative perspective to see what form means and how uh, meaning follows form. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Matthews. I am a student at the Corcoran College of Art and Design slash George Washington University in the Masters of Arts part in the book program. Um, I was just looking at my overall um, courses that I have left within this, this program and I realized out of the blue that I have four more classes left to graduate, so I'm extremely excited. Um, but uh, what I will tell you is um, I came to the Corcoran out of um, being driven into this area of art. Um, I went to school in sociology at Bowie State University. I got my MBA at Bowie State University in, Baltimore, in Bowie, Maryland. And I did that all for my parents. Um, and, and then after I graduated with my MBA, um, I still was bored. Like, there's something more for me to do. So I enrolled, yeah, because you know, after you finish, you figure, you know, you just rest, but not me. And so I enrolled at Anne Arona Community College um, in the graphic arts department and just started taking classes. I started with, you know, um, type and color. I started, you know, doing drawing, even though I'm terrible at drawing, but I was driven to like get into that field. Um, and long story short, so when I got married, I went and purchased my invitations and I totally hated them. They were ugly. 
but I had to send them out anyway because I had a short turnaround time um, before we got married. And so um, once I delivered them, I said, you know, I can do better, right? <coughs> and so uh, when my, daughter, my sister got married, I made her invitations. And then when my cousin got married, I made her invitations and so on and so forth. And it was 10 years where on the side, once or twice during the year, I would make invitations. And then um, I just happened to be on Corcoran's site and I saw um, this program about the uh, interior design. And uh, I thought I wanted to do that. I would look on it, I would look at how many classes I would take, I would look at prerequisites, but I never did register. And then lo and behold, the Art in the Book program showed up on the website, and I'm like, that sounds very interesting. And I looked at the course catalog, and it's letterpress, and I'm like, that's what I wanna do. Or in printmaking, and, um, and so for like three years, I would continue to look at the website and never apply. Um, and there was a little voice every morning would tell me, hey, you should do this, right? And so finally, you know, um, I, I applied. I got into the Corcoran during like the winter session, which was awesome. I was surprised that I actually got into the program only off of the invitations that I had made for those 10 years, by the way, um, because I didn't have like what I felt was a suitable portfolio. But anyway, I went for it and I'm in the program now. So I only have two more semesters to go. But what I'm here to talk about is Centra. Centra was introduced to me by Georgia Deal in my advanced printmaking class uh, last semester. And that was a semester where <coughs> I felt like I kind of came on to my own. Like this is what I am supposed to be doing. It was binding and then printmaking. And so Centra is a plastic PVC sheeting. And you can get this from any plastic what I've already scored, but it's it, usually it's, it's white, bright white. And um, it's very inexpensive. I was able to find it at a local um, factory that was literally like five minutes from my home. And I just ordered one large sheet. They cut it, into, cut it for me in 11 by 17 sheets. I didn't have to do it, but they did it for me. And then I take it and use um, lino cut tools and I score it. And the reason why I came up with this was, like I said before, I'm not a real good drawer, but I'm really interested in textiles and, and dimensions and um, how to make patterns, right? So I used two different plates um, for um, some of the presentations I'm gonna show you. But the first time that I made a print, I just used one color. And as you can see, you can do it, you can lay it any, at any direction because it's kind of fluid, but I started with one color and then I went to two colors. And then I remember doing a critique, I said, I'm going to do four. And everyone was like, you're crazy. <laughs> but, um, but I was just trying to try different things to see what I could do. So I'm gonna pass it around because I'm like a touch and feel person. And um, don't worry about getting it messed up because um, that's what prints are for. For me, I think that you need to touch and feel and see how it um, transforms. But um, so this was the first print that I made um, and it's two colors, blue and red. Um, and I used the same plate so I just turned it upside down on the second run. And I used a, um, a, a tabletop press to run it through. Just like the same thing you would do um, with um, any of the other types of printmaking, just run it right through. And so I tried different types of paper. I tried um, Japanese paper, um, which is kind of fragile, but it was interesting to, to, to be able to do that. Um, but this is when I ran the second color, which is yellow and the turquoise green that, um, that's being passed around right now. And I kind of turned it upside down to see what it would, what it would do and what kind of texture it would create because um, I was just trying to see what would come out of it. And then when you get to three colors, which I think is very interesting, um, and then in this I did two colors of the first plate, which is this one. And I did one color of this plate, which is this one, um, to see what it would turn out to be. And that's also on Japanese print, uh, Japanese paper. And then I learned about 
um, photo plates, which was quite interesting. Um, and so what I did was I chinko laid a picture on top of it along with the center plate. So, um, so I, I would run the actual photo plate and then over on top of it, the second run, I would use the center plate. And I also did it on um, Japanese paper as well, which what also I learned too, um, <laughs> you can't wet it and then chink a and then wet it again. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't stay together. So, um, and that's a whole process of, you know, art. You're just trying to figure it out, what's, what's the best process. And then the final project was creating an actual um, run of six different, six of the same prints um, using the same technique, and um, <coughs> this is what it turned out, which is I think is pretty good, and it's actually on um, handmade paper, which I didn't make, but I purchased. And so the cool thing is if you layer them, it creates a great effect, um, which I thought was quite interesting. So I'll pass this around. Thank you. So my goal is to use this process during my thesis. Um, I really like the textual feel of, you know, some of the things that I've created. And I'm looking forward to, you know, what's in store because I have only four classes left. Thank you. Um, those were simply wonderful, amazing presentations. I go through a lot of... Um, I go to a lot of academic <laughs> conferences, and let me tell you, these were far more interesting than most of the papers that I hear. Um, I'd like all uh, five of the speakers to come forward. Um, we do have time for some questions. Um, give the mic to you, Amy, just in the middle. Uh, for the first speaker, uh, I, was, I was wondering how tight pie is the, the height Korean type. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's less than an inch, maybe. It seemed like it. It, it seemed like there were. Pretty, it wasn't too high. Yeah. Not very high. Yeah. But they all had to be the same, right? No. No? no they're better than an inch. Um, were they cast in iron or were they cast in bronze? Well, I read it was cast in iron. Interesting. Okay, because it's a harder material to work with. Bronze iron? being an easier to do. They had the samples to test, so mm -hmm. I'm sure it's available, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is for the Jefferson Scholar. Yeah. Um, Tristan uh, Stern is one of Jefferson's favorite authors, and I'm, and I'm wondering if the, your um, individual who wrote about this system was familiar with Tristan Shandy. Yeah, uh, he uh, loved uh, Stern. He was actually a, a big uh, fan of Addison and Steele, but in terms of typography, you can see Stern's influence. You can also see um, uh, Swift a little uh, bit. Um, because, you know, the actual the form at the bottom correct. of his letter actually looks like the, the um, narrative form in, in Interest in Chanty. That You mentioned Jefferson um, and his concern about um, giving too much credit to the printer. Uh, he had a real phobia about Jesuits and his great fear <laughs> of letting Jesuits into the country is that they would um, wear normal clothing and start printing. <laughs> Question for you. I, I didn't hear you say where you were working on your, what school? Oh, I'm, I'm at UMBC. Okay. I'm, in, I'm in Baltimore right now. Yeah, just finishing up my dissertation. Goddard was from a printing family. Her uh, brother uh, was uh, a printer, William Goddard. Um, he was the initial printer in the family, but his mother and his sister, uh, Mary Catherine, uh, often actually took over the print shop when he was away for various journeys. Uh, he wasn't actually a, an especially reliable guy, uh, according to many recount, uh, accounts. And uh, Mary Catherine actually ran this shop, as far as we know, both in Philadelphia and, and later in Baltimore for <coughs> about 30 years between the two of them. 
was her uh, version uh, with the printed names, is that considered the second? Yes. Um, yes, that would be the second behind um, Dunlap's. Dunlap's. Yeah. history of the book, I make all the class stand up and make them repeat after me. First book printed with movable metal type in Western Europe. <laughs> so they can say it fluently. And we, do the same, <laughs> we do the same with the docents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking of your the beautiful dancing type of Hopkinson and thinking of uh, Maybe the next one was The Mouse's Tale in, in uh, Alice, where the type goes sort of like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled. When I, when I came across this, I, I knew the, of Stern. I knew of uh, some of the British um, you know, precedents, which were few and far between. Um, but there's a, a huge gap, which I, as far as I've seen, I can't explain. I, I've, spoken with folks at the American Antiquarian Society and the like, and, um, and this is a, a, a strange anomaly in, in, in some ways. Um, but I, I like the, the larger idea of Hopkinson being a non-printer specifically and working with all of these various groups and how this network of printers uh, who shouldn't have liked one another in many ways, at least in terms of business and, and business rivalries, financial reasons or political reasons, uh, whether they were Tories or um, you know, uh, more patriotic. Uh, and yet, in various cases, you know, this network uh, or circuit, if you're a book historian, uh, consistently <coughs> changes uh, and evolves, and it's, it's almost like comedy. In many ways, you know, Hopkinson was a comedian. Uh, he meant this to be a joke and lighthearted um, and, or, or satirical. And uh, you know he needed that. I think that sense of humor from the printers and that willingness to to improvise and, and uh, you know change. You know, so. Could I ask the uh, printmaker uh, are you printing all your uh, work on damp paper? Um, all the paper that's not Japanese stamp. Yes, it is wet. Yeah. And yeah. what kind of ink are you using with the uh, etching? paper um, will give you like a really decent cyanotype. Um, what I'm doing now, I'm the strangest paper maker and Casey can tell you. Um, <clears throat> I am actually, I grind mica up 
yeah. in my paper. So I have a hand I have mica and cyanotypes together, and okay. I'm trying to tweak that to figure out how to get the cyanotype to go over the mica as well. Yeah, I do have to be affected by the side mica because of the other competing isotopes. You have to use it. You have to leave it in the. Um, you can't do it out in the sun. Honestly, yeah. you have to do the UV lights and the photos. And, yeah. Wow. Strangely enough, I'm a museum technician, <coughs> which is not strange, but anyway, um, I don't know why I said that, uh, but they, it's very regenerative. So when you leave the cyanotypes out and they start to fade, you can put them in a closet for like maybe two or three weeks, and then all of a sudden they're back to their deep blue again. So it actually, it, once it takes wow. into the paper, it's yeah, it's bad. really bizarre. Yeah. So it's one of those so things. <laughs> well, from, from my point, I, I don't know, um, but they have, um, I think the Getty Museum has several Anna Atkins originals, and they actually have regenerative properties to where they are. So far, so good. Yeah, isn't that strange? But yeah, whatever is in there. I don't know if it'll do it with the handmade paper because of the sizing, but um, on the watercolor paper and the cotton paper, it's Permanent than a CD. Exactly. <laughs> Travis, uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned to me that you ventured out into the into the working world. Mm -hmm. Talk for just a second about how you're finding uh, this interest of yours. Are you finding use for it? Are are you? Is this interest in type uh, sort of pushing you in directions in, in your working life as a designer? I think potentially. <clears throat> it could, especially for graphic design. Uh, letterpress for people is becoming a novelty in a way. Um, so I think having this skill is completely useful. Um, not right now, right now it's a way for me to get away from the computer um, and just sort of do what I wanna do, whether it's a printmaking process or letterpress or painting or whatever. It's, just, it's becoming another thing that's sort of like almost therapeutic in a way for me. So that's how I utilize it. Welcome to Apple. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thanks all, to all of you for coming. Special thanks to our really, I mean, I'm unspeakably proud of our inaugural class of Denker Fellows. It's amazing, amazing work. And so one more giant Hand of applause, please. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.